So when you buy a product, you're clearly buying it for more than it costs to make. The difference between the cost to make and the purchase price, some form of profit. But how much do chips actually cost to produce? What's your minimum specification? So the tale for this story goes back at least a year and a half ago when I promised a retired engineer that I would do this content. It's all about how much it costs to create chips. And there are two ways to look at this. One is going from the cost per wafer and how much money that a company can make for a whole individual wafer, all the way down to how much a chip actually costs to produce, how much uh, the raw materials are worth and kind of you know, working towards the middle. Now I'm gonna start with uh, the processors. Let's have a look at one of you know Intel's 9900K processors, uh, top of the line, eight core chip at the time. And it went on for retail for $525. And the die size is, I've got it written here, about uh, 180 square millimeters. So that chip is being sold for $2.9 per square millimeter. It's actually one of Intel's higher cost chips actually. So with that die size, uh, if you put these into the die per wafer calculator that we used in the last video, you can see that uh, if we get 100% yield and a low edge loss ratio, then if Intel had a whole wafer of these processors, they're looking at about mm, 314 processors. And if they sold at retail, Intel would be earning about $164,000 from that processor. Now let's go to something a little bit bigger. Let's say uh, one of Intel's large 28 core Skylake or Cascade Lake Xeons, uh, you know, one like this. They're pulling in north of 600 square millimeters and the 8280L, when it was first launched, cost over $17,000. For that processor, we're looking at, when my numbers here say 76 dies per wafer, uh, Selling at $17,906 means that Intel's getting $1.36 million per wafer, assuming 100% yield. Now, in terms of cost per millimeter squared, we're looking at roughly about $25 per square millimeter. I think $25.66 per square millimeter, which is pretty insane. So what about AMD with its processors? Something like the uh, Ryzen 7 4750G. It's their Zen 2 Renoir APU. Never really had a retail price, but we saw it sold for about $323. It's what, uh, 149 square millimeters. This, that on a wafer, can earn AMD about $140,000, which surprisingly enough, if you do the uh, same math with Navi, taking Navi uh, 21's retail price of $999, AMD actually makes about 30 to 40% more manufacturing Zen 2 APUs than it does Navi GPUs. Now don't forget, we're talking about CPU versus GPU there. For a CPU, you have to take the die and package it on a substrate. And that's your product. Uh, packaging, testing and packaging is usually about, you know, 10 to $20 at most for a whole processor. With a GPU, you're not only buying the silicon, you're the silicon on the package, you're also buying the board and the power delivery, and even the really expensive GDDR memory. With a processor, that's at least all handed over to the motherboard side of the equation. So going from that 30 to 40% that AMD makes more on their APUs per wafer than it did with Navi, you know, assuming 100% yield, then that actually increases when you factor in that board cost. Now, the yield of Navi, because it's such a larger chip, you might imagine is probably lower than that of the uh, Renoir APUs, that difference is gonna go heavily more towards APUs. And it seems to be in a weird position to say that it sounds like AMD would make a lot more money manufacturing APUs than it would do uh, graphics processors. So how does this all come back around to wafer cost? Now wafers are made of silicon and there are companies that manufacture silicon ingots. You do this by having ultra pure silicon that comes from quartz. I'm sorry, it doesn't actually come from sand. Maybe I'll do a more detailed video about how to make uh, ingots in the future. But you essentially stretch a seed silicon into an ingot and depending on the speed at which you pull it out of the molten silicon that determines you know, roughly how big your ingot is and then you polish it and cut it and you get your wafer. Now these ingots can be hundreds and hundreds of kilos, you can get millions of wafers out of a single ingot. But the actual cost to buy those just individual plain ready to use wafers if you don't want it specialized doped or if you don't want it specialized uh, 
configuration you can do it in different lattice structures as well the prices i've seen online range anywhere from about 100 to 400 dollars it also depends on how many you buy because there are obviously bulk uh, savings to be had so that's our base raw material cost 400 dollars so now of course the wafer goes to the fab whether that's uh, tsmc in taiwan and intel in the us or israel or ireland the wafer then goes through the system now wafers are generally put together in batches of 25 and they go around the whole industrial complex of a fab in what are called foops uh, front opening unified platform or something or other our wafers are 12 inches in diameter and we have moved 25 of them at a time in a box and it, and it just weighs too much for one person to do repetitive moves so we had to automate it when we talk about the vehicles it's part of our amhs system our automated material handling system it's the transportation vehicle that picks up the product and delivers it to the process tool. It takes it from the process tool and delivers it to the next process tool. If the tool's not ready, it puts it in a storage unit. Cool thing number two, the automated superhighway, or as they call it here, ASH. Automated material handling systems like these are common in our factories. Those things you see moving on overhead monorail systems are called FOOPs, front opening unified pods. Each FOOP carries as many as 25 wafers on their journey from blank silicon disks to wafers containing up to hundreds of Intel chips. Arizona's ASH-1 and ASH-2 connect all four factories. End-to-end -end is a distance of one mile. Every hour, about 1,000 FOOPs move through each ASH. I believe that's actually the minimum order when you want to create a chip, a FOOP, to, at least for the high-end process nodes, because then the idea is that the FOOP can land at a machine, the machine can process all 25 wafers, then the FOOP will take the wafers and then either put them in storage or put them to the next machine. And we know that modern processes take hundreds and hundreds of steps where they just keep going from machine to machine. You've got uh, pre-production, you've got production, you've got metrology, which is testing to make sure that what was printed was accurate. And then, you know, additional maintenance. That's even before you get to the substrate, the packaging, and actually putting it on, you know, the little green PCB. When you interact with a company like TSMC, um, you'll put in your order. There's obviously a minimum order that you have to put in. And, you know, it'll, you'll either be a big customer, you're ordering tens of thousands of wafers per month, or you're a small customer uh, doing, you know, hundreds of wafers per month. So big customer, kind of like AMD, Apple, small customer, like Cerebrus, I guess. If you haven't seen my video on Cerebus, uh, you can click up here and uh, see the biggest processor you'll ever see. Nobody really knows uh, TSMC's process for how it charges companies different amounts. The reason for this is on the leading edge, uh, TSMC will work with partner companies like AMD, like Apple, to help refine the next generation process node technology. So for example, for N5, Apple is the lead customer for the TSMC N5 5 nanometer process. So there would have been a good amount of collaboration, TSMC putting in some money, Apple putting in some money. So overall the wave cost will be you know down, but the yields will be lower until the yields get to a good amount. Right now we're seeing uh, yields for N5 and N7 being actually roughly the same, at least in terms of uh, defect rate. Now, TSMC also does a lot of the packaging technologies as well. Uh, they last year announced their you know, 3D fabric network array of uh, packaging. So you can have HBM, you can have interposers, you can do their equivalent of uh, EMIB or Foveros. They've got a wafer on wafer stacking. They've got a special technology that allows them to stack 12 wafers with through silicon vias if they need to. I think that's pretty amazing. But all this comes at a cost. Uh, exactly what cost would depend on how many but also the priority order i've heard stories that uh tsmc has you know titanium and gold and silver customers and the higher you are you know the better deals you get but also the higher priority you do there is talk about these contracts never specifying you know dates for delivery of chips but just ranges of dates such that if there's a period of high demand <coughs> tsmc can sell wafers at a higher cost to a competitor in order to get them in front of yours or they will turn around to you and perhaps say give us a bit more and we'll make sure that you're further up the line tsmc never talk about this so it's hard to verify what is real um, and what is you know just people making up stories but suffice to say it's very very complicated and you have to be one of their biggest time uh, partners lots of commitment lots of future no development in order to get the best rates so 
here are the numbers. Now I'm going to put the caveat on these numbers uh, because there are always caveats. This is from a presentation by Dr. Sofu Wilson um, in about the 2016-2017 time frame. Uh, she is a fellow at ARM. She's been working at Broadcom for uh, a couple of decades at least now, I think, working on modem technology. And um, she's a really good speaker. I very much encourage you to uh, go check out some of her presentations uh, on YouTube. I sit for a couple of hours watching those, and they're really detailed about how the first ARM designs worked versus you know going from single core to multi core in the modem space in the uh, in the sort of home broadband space. The sort of of course that she worked on there. So it's not a law, of course. It's the empirical observation, and it's been hugely revised over time. Um, but the observation goes that um, the number of transistors on a piece of silicon doubles every two years. Uh, he originally phrased it differently, and it's currently not true. Um, Intel has been stuck on 14 nanometers for the last five years. So we'll look into why that is as the talk goes on. Uh, seven nanometer, there's a little uh, asterisk next to the seven nanometer, which we'll talk about in a future slide, uh, which, which will come around in about 2020. Um, and there's a, there's a reason why I say it's 2020. Um, if you have a 125 watt power limit, we have to turn off half the transistors. We've got to turn off half the die. We still make you pay for those transistors, but we're not going to let you use them. Information. This is from TSMC. And what it, what it basically says is, as we come down the process geometry size, we obligingly get more and more uh, gates per square millimeter. Um, you know, down to a seven nanometer, where you get 17 million gates per square millimeter. So one square millimeter, 17 million gates, or as I like to think of it, three fire paths. Um, we have difficulty packing them together, so you can see the gate utilization has fallen. This is because the rules we have to obey to get the thing manufactured are so much harsher. So the used gates aren't scaling as rapidly. And we can also see the cost per gate. It fell to a minimum in 28 and is beginning to rise again. That's really bad. But she presented this table about how much wafer costs were at the time then. Now, this is a lot of information, but the key metric here, I think, is the cost per wafer. Now, this shows wafers from 90 nanometer all the way down to 7 nanometer. Now, at the time, 7 nanometer was a future process node technology, but TSMC was still taking orders. Now, if we look at the results, it's, you know, 90 nanometers, you're looking at $1,300 per wafer. Now, those wafers um, are obviously cheaper. They're 8 inch wafers, not 12 inch wafers. The $400 I gave you before was for a 12 inch wafer. So, 8 inch wafers are probably, you know, $100 or less. But then, you know, it goes up in price. We've got 65 nanometer at uh, $1,585, 40 nanometer at $1,900, all the way up to, you know, 14, 16, 14 nanometer at $4,000, and then finally 7 nanometer at $5,800. So that's very different from what a lot of people have been saying online. And I think that's due in part to how competitive uh, TSMC's 7 nanometer node has been, because there's been such a high demand for it. Uh, TSMC are quite happy to put up the prices if people are to pay for it. I've seen price estimates anywhere from, say, $7,000 to $14,000 per wafer, bearing in mind that the raw material cost is probably $400 or less. So what does that exactly mean for the companies that are buying the chips? Uh, what they do is, you know, they pay for the masks, uh, they pay for all the little um, steps that need to be done and the masks for those steps, and they hand them to TSMC. Actually, I think TSMC has some of that in-house. TSMC uses those in a manufacturing process and then charges, you know, say $6,000 a wafer for 7 nanometer. And then that uh, wafer goes either to packaging at TSMC's packaging technologies or at uh, other different OSATs that other companies might use. So if we're just looking at the pure wafer cost, add in some extra for packaging, let's put aside R&D for a second and let's just say $6,000 per wafer. AMD, with its uh, Renoir Zen 2 APUs, they create about 400 of those per wafer. And if we assume 100% yield and about a $323 uh, selling price, 
That Wayfair has the potential for to earn $130,000. That's $130,000 of chips for $6,000 cost in terms of actually production and packaging. This is a, you know, a ratio of what, 21 and a half, which given the markups that these industries have to do, you kind of think, well, yeah, that's why, you know, semiconductors are profitable. Now, 21 and a half seems quite a lot. If you look at the gross margins for some of these companies, uh, AMDs at what, 46%, Intel's in the mid 50s, uh, low 60s usually. So even though, you know, there's a factor of 21 here, or say for, I've got the numbers for Big Navi is about 17. There's a lot of other stuff that goes on, uh, marketing, shipping, um, beyond packaging, actually working with partners to co-develop systems, that sort of thing. It helps that semiconductors can be sold for so much, but then it, you know, also looking at how much it costs to build a fab, you've got to look at, say, TSMC's financials and see just how many wafers they're putting through and what that makes for revenue. Uh, I think at last count, TSMC was producing the equivalent of 3.3 million wafers per quarter, or about 1 million wafers per month. In those numbers, actually, TSMC is 49% uh, leading edge, so that's uh, 7 nanometer and uh, 5 nanometer, and then anything above that is no longer called leading edge, and that's still 51% of the revenue. At the minute, TSMC is making about 160,000 wafers on leading edge, and that's contributing 49% of revenue. The other 51% of revenue is uh, about 800,000 wafers, equivalent 12-inch wafers. So one potato question to ask is who makes the most money per wafer when they buy from TSMC? I'm going to say that is currently Cerebrus. So Cerebrus's wafer scale chip, 46,000 square millimeters, they get 100% yield anyway because their architecture is built to, to go around defects. One of these wafers gets about 40 to 45 defects per wafer and they've found a way to build around that with their chip. They sell one of those chips in a 15U system for about two, two and a half million. Now that's 16 nanometer. The seven nanometer version costs probably about twice as much. So for a wafer that costs $6,000, add in the packaging, they're using really special packaging. So no doubt the cost is perhaps doubled than that. So even 12,000. They're selling a full rack system for two, two and a half million for a chip that's costing about say even if we're liberal you know 15 20 000 to make that's an insane markup but obviously they're doing very small runs of uh, processors there so my minimum specification is i would like to see these companies actually produce numbers about how much their wafers are being sold for now that will never happen i'm really surprised uh, that this slide was shown at a presentation uh, even you know pre seven nanometers so it's a little bit old at this point but i still think it's entirely relevant it gets more complicated with chiplets because you've got stuff coming from tsmc and stuff coming from global foundries and then you've got to put it together and you're shipping from different parts of the world uh, for your packaging and your testing this will only ever get more complicated uh, as we move forward if you watch to the end there'll be a cat tax but in the meantime if you like the video please give a like and a subscribe if you don't please let me know in the comments uh, what you'd like to see change but as always, what's your minimum specification?